Thank you. I'm going to be speaking about identifying business opportunities. And those of us who are looking at starting our own organizations or companies, or businesses, or even not-for-profits, how do you identify the right business opportunity? I'm going to be telling three stories from my life uh, about businesses that I have started and how uh, we got the idea. When I was finishing at IIM Ahmedabad in my second year during placement season, uh, those of us who are familiar with business schools, you know, there's a placement week or a placement uh, fortnight, and companies come and they try and recruit students. At the better campuses, uh, there's a lot of competition among companies to get the best students, those they want to hire. And therefore, day one of placement week is a very coveted spot among companies. Uh, in my year, there were four companies on day one. Uh, there was Citibank, there was Hindustan Lever, there was Bank of America, and there was Procter & Gamble. Right? This is 1989, pre-liberalization, so no hedge funds, no private equity, none of those. They hadn't come into India yet. These were the top four companies on campus then. Uh, and I was helping out the placement office, volunteering to be a kind of concierge, you know, making sure that uh, students were lining up for interviews on time, uh, making sure tea, coffee, biscuits were served, making sure CVs were received by the, by the interviewers and so on. Now, Citibank had come with eight interviewers, and therefore they were running four panels. Hindustan Lever was running two panels. They had got four interviewers only. And the Hindustan Lever head of HR got worried, saying that Citibank will process candidates faster than we will. Uh, they will make offers, and people will accept and drop out of placement and will not even come for our final interviews. So he began to make offers across the table. Uh, short circuiting the process and saying, okay, here's your offer letter, sign right now, accept and walk with me to the placement office uh, and opt out of placement and don't go for any further interviews. Now, this was completely against placement rules at IIM Ahmedabad. And that year, uh, this caused a lot of chaos and um, other companies got hassled, uh, Citibank got hassled and the rules of placement had to be changed that year. There was a GBM held in the evening and everybody's very excited and some people were, you know, uh, for Hindustan Lever, some people were, you know, for Citibank and so on and so forth. But from there, I got our first business idea. I said to myself, if this is how companies compete for talent at I'm Ahmedabad campus, then if we were to do a salary survey of, salary, of, of offers that companies were making on campus uh, at the IIMs to fresh graduates, then this report would have a market because companies would want better information about competing offers so as to fine-tune their own offer to attract the better talent. And that is what our first product was. And it succeeded almost immediately. We launched it about a couple of years later. Uh, but I worked for a while and then did this. Uh, but it succeeded almost immediately. And this taught me one very important lesson that successful businesses are built on deep customer insights. Okay. By observing companies compete firsthand on campus, I had the insight that if we were to do this kind of report, it would succeed. Okay. So successful businesses are built on deep customer insights about unsolved problems of your prospective customers. Okay. That was the first business we did. The second business we did was a very niche business, which frankly, for the life of me, I would never have got the idea. Okay. So I had a partner. We were 50-50. And he had done a summer training, a summer internship, at his uncle's uh, firm. His uncle is an intellectual property lawyer, a trademark lawyer. Now, we know what trademarks are, right? Trademarks are brand names, logos, mnemonics, anything that distinguishes your product from those of your competition. Trademarks in India are governed by the Trademarks Act. It's an act of parliament. And this act of parliament is implemented and monitored the activity is monitored by the trademark registry, which is reports to the Ministry of Industry.
Now, companies, uh, you know, would therefore get protection and have exclusive right to use a particular trademark if they had got their trademark registered with the trademark registry. Right? So if my trademark is Nokri and I've got it registered, nobody else can use the name Nokri for that product category. Right? If I don't have it registered, then others can use it also. And that's not such a good thing for us. So companies like to get their trademarks registered. The only problem is, and was at that stage, that the trademark registry would take five years to say yes or no. Your trademark is registered. Now, companies can't wait five years to launch a new brand. They will think of it today. They will want to launch as soon as possible, maybe over the next couple of years. So what they would do is they would hire lawyers who would go to the trademark registry library and inspect the archive of registered and pending applications for trademarks and assess, are you likely to be accepted or rejected? Basis whether there was a similar trademark registered or applied for before you. So one of the big reasons for rejection was somebody else has already got the same trademark or applied for it before you or a similar trademark. Right? And these lawyers would then submit reports. Now, my partner had been to the trademark registry to do a few searches because he had gone there in his internship at the trademark lawyer's firm. And he came back and he said, listen, this system is broken. It's very unreliable. It's time consuming. And it is expensive. So in 1989, there were 6 lakh registered and pending trademarks in India across 34 categories. The largest category of pharmaceuticals with 80,000 trademarks. Okay. The archive was not computerized. It was not in indexed in alphabetical order of trademark. It was mostly in files with two pages to a trademark application in reverse chronological order of application. The most recent was on top. So in order to do a search in the pharmaceutical category, you had to do this. One lakh sixty thousand times. Right? And for this, lawyers got paid 150 rupees. Right? So they would wait for a whole batch of trademarks to build up, maybe 10, 15, 20, so that they can earn 3,000 rupees to do this one lakh sixty thousand times. But because the process was manual, there were often errors and you know it was unreliable. So from this, we got our second idea. We went in, we hired a bunch of students, gave them registers, and we said, these seven fields, we want you to transcribe in the pharmaceutical category only. Why did you choose pharmaceutical? Because there were 80,000 trademarks, the largest scope for a conflict. Somebody else would have applied, thought of a similar name earlier. Right? And within two weeks, we had transcribed the relevant fields of the record, and two weeks more, we had them input, and another week, we had written the software uh, to search this database. The software would search, you input a string, soft, it will query database, come out with a short list of potentially similar marks, which you would then screen manually and edit, and come down to 15, 20, 30, possibly, conflicting marks, or similar marks, and send it to your client, and you could do the whole thing, and you could, we could ship a report in 24 hours, the earlier process is to take six weeks. Right? This service too was an immediate success. We wrote to pharma companies, we introduced the service to them, we said you're doing it manually, it takes six weeks, uh, it's expensive, it's unreliable, uh, you had problems in the past, you can get a report in 24 hours from us, it's, it's done on a computer. Immediate success. Now, here again, the point I want to make is that for the life of me, I would never have thought of this idea. That in this trademark registries, around that ecosystem, there is a gap and there's a possibility of filling it using technology and it will solve an unsolved problem. It is because my partner had that insight that there exists this unsolved problem. And there are 5,000 pharma companies out there 
whom we could potentially service. And then keep on giving us repeat business because pharma companies register many trademarks. Right? That we were able to launch and make this service succeed. So once again, single point I want to emphasize is successful businesses are often built on deep customer insight of about unsolved problems of your prospective customers. So focus on your customer, get that insight, figure out the unsolved problem, solve it, hopefully you will succeed. Or your chances of success multiply many fold. The third business that we started, uh, well not the third, but one of the other businesses we started a few years later was Nokri. And that story I think is reasonably well documented as to where the idea came from. So I used to work um, in marketing in the company that makes and sells Holix. I was in, in brand management. And there were eight, 10 of us in brand management who used to sit in an open hall. Open hall means I could see what they were doing and I could hear what they were saying on the phone. And I used to, and I used to observe a very strange thing, that every time the office copy of Business India came and was circulated from desk to desk, everybody would leaf through the magazine from the back. Because there were 35 to 40 pages of appointment ads in Business India in those days. It was the number one appointment ad medium for managers. And then this whole discussion would start. Hey, there's this job going here. What do you think? Uh, you know, and people start talking about it. You know, and it was, it, so I came to one conclusion that jobs are a very high interest category of information. Everybody is interested in at least talking about a job, looking at a job, benchmarking, figuring out what's going on, even if they're not looking for a job. Okay. The second thing that I noticed was that every week, one or two or three headhunters would call up and try and headhunt one or the other of my colleagues. Open hall, I could hear the conversation, at least from one side. Right? And I figured that every time it was a different headhunter with a different job in a different company, and these jobs were never advertised. So first insight, jobs are a high interest category of information. Second, third, fourth insights, uh, most jobs are not advertised. There are hundreds, maybe thousands of headhunters out there, servicing maybe tens of thousands of companies, which means there are possibly lakhs of jobs out there. In a fragmented manner. And therefore, if somebody were to aggregate all these jobs and keep and build a database and keep it live and current in one place and somehow make it accessible to the public, some, some magic could happen. Now this is 1990, there's no internet, I have never heard of it. It does not exist. Right? So I don't know what to do with this insight. So it became one of those file and forget kind of insights. And I became an entrepreneur and we did the salary survey. Then we did a trademark database. And we did a hundred other small things. In 1996, when I saw the internet for the first time at a IT expo, in Pragati Medan, not far from here, uh, there was a small stall which said WWW. I didn't know what it was. Right? This is October 96. And I went to the guy and I said, you know, what is this? And he said, this is email. Now, in those days, uh, VSN had a monopoly on internet access. And email came bundled with internet access. And, you know, things like Gmail and Hotmail and, you know, Yahoo Mail did not exist. So if you wanted email, you had to buy it from VSNL, and it came bundled with internet access. So I had heard of email, I had never seen it, I didn't know anybody who had email. So he gave me a demo, and uh, I said, you know what, I think this will be a complete failure. And uh, he said, why? I said, look, I mean, I don't know anybody who has email, so whom will I write to, and who will write to me? You know, it's like uh, I have the only phone in the world, whom will I talk to? So I began to walk away. He said, no, sir, come back, come back. Uh, sir, this is also internet. So I said, what is internet? And he said, sir, WWW stands for World Wide Web. 
So I said, okay. So what does it mean? He said, there are thousands of computers all over the world, and you can sit in your home or office if you have internet access, and can search information across all these computers. So I said, show me. So he gave me a demo, and you know, he took me to a site called Yahoo, and you know, in those days, there was no color monitors in India. There was no TCP IP access. If your shell account access looks like DOS or Unix, you know, no graphics, only text. But it looked very exciting to me. So I told him, listen, I, so I, I immediately began to join the dots. And I said, look, if you can put out a jobs database, uh, you know, it might, uh, it might work. Uh, and uh, so I asked him, how many internet accounts are there in India? He told me 14,000. Now, 14,000 looks like a large number to me then. And I said, look, I don't want to buy internet access. I want to run one of those computers. He said, for that, you have to go to the US. All servers are in the US. There are no servers in India. So that's when we got the idea of Knockery. Once again, deep customer insight. Jobs are a high interest category of information. Uh, there's a large fragmented database of jobs out there. If you can aggregate them and keep them current, something will happen. So I'll end by repeating this. Successful businesses are often built on deep customer insights about unsolved problems of your prospective customers. Okay? So the best opportunities are all around us. Learn to recognize them. Thank you.